Hi everyone, so the, I'm Lin Zhou Xue from Penn State University and NIS. So first I want to thank all of you for attending today's event. So this is the first session in a new series of the tutorials on some of the most interesting topics in data science. Today we are fortunate to have Victor Lowe from Fidelity Investments, so who will provide an overview of essential data science approaches for business. Victor is a seasoned big data marketing risk and finance leader with over 25 years of extensive consulting and corporate experiences. He's a pioneer of uplift true lift modeling, so which is a subfield of the data science, which is a key subfield. He currently leads the AI and data science center for excellence, workplace investing at Fidelity Investment. So let's welcome Victor. Thank you, Ling Chao. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this session. So I'm going to talk about 10 ex exciting analytics topics that may not be covered in uh, general statistics programs. So uh, first, I will talk about three kinds of analytics and then describe what data scientists uh, usually have in terms, of, in terms of their skills. And then we'll dive into the 10 topics. The disclaimer is that the views here do not represent uh, Fidelity Investments. Long time ago, a well-known statistician, John Tukey, said the best thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everyone's Backyard. More recently, Charlie Meng said, we are now being invited into everyone's study room or living room, entrusted with the task of being their offspring's first corn nanny. So what it means is statistics and data science are now used uh, everywhere and now uh, across all industries. And it's getting more and more popular and more important. So we'll jump into uh, three types of analytics. Um, there are three kinds, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. The first level is descriptive. It's about what happened in the past. And things like uh, business, report, business reports, statistical tests, they all fall under here, and data visualization. And we'll have a, uh, a topic on descriptive analytics. The second level is predictive, which is about predicting the future or predicting something you don't know yet. Uh, more forward looking. And the last level, the third level is prescriptive. If you know something about the future, would that influence your decision? Would that improve your uh, action in the future? So that would support decision making. Let's take a look at some examples. Uh, in terms of weather forecast, the weather report about yesterday's weather is kind of a descriptive analytics because it's about yesterday, it's about what happened already. But it's still important. It might give you some trend and some uh, geographic differences. Let's say the weather forecast tells you it's going to be a huge snowstorm tomorrow, not in June, but sometime this winter. So if it tells you it tells you it's going to be a big snowstorm tomorrow, what are you gonna do? So we may have two choices. You can still go to work or school, or you can work from home. Uh, however, the decision may depend on what you think about the causal impact of taking each of these decisions. So that's why there's a causality between, causality link between predictive and prescriptive. So let's say historically, you know that when there's a big snowstorm going to work, would cause some safety issue, uh, but would increase work effectiveness. But if you work from home, you may not be able to work efficiently or effectively, but you will be completely safe and you have gathered that kind of historical data. You can causally infer the outcome of taking either action on safety and benefit. And then you can balance between safety and benefit in order to pick the right decision for you. So picking the right decision is a form of prescriptive analytics or optimization. And that usually requires some kind of 
causal inference, causality, causality assessment. Uh, let's talk next. Let's talk about what kind of skills data scientists usually have. If you Google about data scientists, you might see a Venn diagram like this. They tend to have obviously statistics and math skills and computer science skills like programming uh, and data, data processing and so on. They also have uh, some, at least some form of subject matter expertise. If they're doing something about risk management, uh, generally they need to know something about either market risk, credit risk or operational risk or all of the above. And typically soft skills are extremely important, especially in the business world. And because we need to communicate with uh, the business stakeholders. So the, uh, the setup here applies to business, but also applies to many other fields as well. So data science itself is a pretty diversified field with professionals from uh, many different areas. So why is it data scientists need to know that many skills? So let's take a look at a typical data science project. This first step is usually defining the scope, doing some consulting, and then gathering and processing data, building some models or doing some heavy analytics, extracting insights, presenting, and then using the model. Now, if you, we only have, if we only know how to do model development, then it will be just inside step number four. Data scientists are usually required to, to be involved in almost all the stages here, uh, from defining the scope to data processing and to uh, using the model. So that's why data scientists typically are required to know a lot of things, not just one thing. So now let's get into the top 10 topics that may not be covered in your program. First one is consulting, communication, and soft skills. Analytic consulting is surrounded by many things, many, uh, many areas. First one is business communication. In order to work with the business, we need to understand their language and we need to communicate in their own language. So that's, that's why business communication is so important. And obviously when we present to them, we also need to speak their language. If we only use statistical or data science jargon, that would be difficult to present or communicate. And visualization and data storytelling skills help a lot. And not only you need to communicate with business folks, you also need to communicate with IT and data professionals because you, you need to rely on them to give you data and also to deploy your models. So, so quite often we work with them uh, quite a lot and they have another set of languages that you need to learn about. Uh, here's a general analytic consulting process. From initiating a project, defining scope, proposing a solution, identifying resources, and leading the project, as well as leading the usage of the project or deployment of the, of, of the model. So instead of going through these things step by step, uh, I can mention something about my own career. I left academia for the industry 26 years ago. And when I first got into the industry, uh, I became a junior level data scientist, more focused on uh, really num inside number five, building models. And then slowly and actually quickly, I got involved in uh, multiple phases, not only presentation to the clients, interacting with the clients. By the way, I was in a uh, management consulting, large management consulting firm, uh, working on marketing science. So, I got involved in many other things, uh, interacting with clients, uh, interacting with other folks, proposing solutions, and gradually uh, I got involved in all the stages end to end. So, so, so that's why uh, bus the business consulting process is so important. The second topic is computer science programming and tools. And obviously when we do analytics or data science or, or statistics, we need uh, computing tools to support us. The demand for computational power has increased dramatically over, over the last many years and will further increase. The reason is number one, there's a huge growth in 
structure and unstructured data. Structured data is numerical data, just data in numbers. Unstructured data is almost everything else. And the most common forms are text, voice, and images. Uh, most people believe that vast majority, maybe 90% of the world's data are unstructured, written in some kind of documents or images or voice. So that becomes big, bigger and bigger, both of them. Second, second reason is uh, IoT, Internet of Things. We now have data coming out from many, many devices. In addition to, in addition to cell phones and computers, we have data coming out from your, from your cars, from maybe from your thermostat, uh, some devices such as Alexa or Google Home, uh, and many other devices, and even refrigerator and washing machines could generate data. So that's one, re one other reason why we have so much data coming out. The third, re the third reason for increasing computational power is the success of deep learning. Deep learning has been, has been extremely su successful and will, be, will continue to be very successful in the, in the next several years to come. And deep learning uh, is extremely powerful for prediction. However, it does require a lot of data. It also estimates a, a model with a lot of parameters or weights. Quite often it has thousands, millions, or even billions of parameters to estimate. As a result, it does require heavy computational power to catch up with the, uh, the models. The market research firm IDC recently predicted that the global data size would increase by three times uh, to 175 sectabytes, which is a huge, huge data. That's why computational power is so important. So now that's the, the need. So what are the things that we need to, uh, we need to learn about from, the, from computer science? I categorize them into five categories. First one is programming languages. In the past, people usually just needed to learn a couple of common commercial statistical languages. But now uh, most people are using Python and R, at least in the AI and ML world, in the data science world. And some of them also have to pick up Java, uh, JavaScript and C++ for efficiency. Second, you need the tools, you need the packages to run models. Uh, there are lots of them available. This is one, this is a, a part of the list, PyTorch, Keras, TensorFlow, and so on. So once you have, you have the languages and you have the tools, of course you need the data. And in order to analyze the data, you need to know something about the data. Because data are so massive, they could come in from different uh, data sources. They could be structured and unstructured. So knowing something about the data, which fields should be used for what kind of things is very important. So data knowledge is very important. And then once you have the data and the tools, you need to extract the data and put it in the right place. So data, data processing, data extraction like ETL uh, for big data requires some kind of skills. So let's say you already produce a model, then you need to work with IT to implement them. So implementing uh, a model used to be pretty simple, but now it has some uh, better and more efficient process through containerization and so on. So these are some of the, the IT techniques that would allow you to implement models efficiently. But topic number three is descriptive analytics. So we're getting into the pyramid now, the first level descriptive. Descriptive analytics is surrounded by uh, multiple things. The first one is obviously statistical graphics or data visualization. As you may have heard, a, a picture is worth a thousand works. So it continues to be extremely important, especially when communicating with the business, but also giving yourself some insights for the next step. Numbers are still important, like business reports, summary statistics, and so on. Now the combination of data visualization and, and uh, reports and numbers also help you with number three. Quite often, if you are going to build a predictive model, you will do some kind of descriptive analytics first. So descriptive analytics, number one and number two, would allow you to, uh, to shortlist some variables before you build models. 
And that is in, in the machine learning world is called feature selection or in statistics world it's called variable selection. So let's take a look at one simple example. Let's say we are interested in understanding death rate and birth rate by country. So in this example, by plotting death rate against birth rate, you immediately see that there's a cluster of countries that have high birth rate and high death rate. There's another group that has lower birth rate and lower death rate. Okay, so the natural question is why? So you can overlay the graphic with uh, things like literacy. In this case, the bubble size represents the literacy. Smaller means lower literacy. So you can immediately see that uh, countries with lower literacy level have higher death rate and also higher birth rate. So these graphics are taken from uh, Lee Wilkinson, who will be one of the instructors to, to teach uh, our topic. So he will be focused on descriptive analytics. And we will have um, other experts teach other topics among these 10 uh, important topics. So topic number four is the second level, predictive analytics. Now, this is my own classification of predictive analytics, and some other people may have classified them differently. Statisticians are generally very familiar with regression-based methods, so which I call them traditional regression methods. But there's a difference between statistical inference and prediction. Uh, there's some well-known papers, for example, Leo Bryman in 2001, and last month, uh, Brad Efron uh, published a paper in JASA. They both talked about the difference between statistical inference and prediction. Inference is about understanding something about uh, the data generating process in the population using a random sample. And also learning about the relationships between the, the variables. Prediction is really about predicting the future or predicting some kind of unknown. They are interrelated but not identical. So traditional regression techniques still can be used to do, to do both. Uh, but there are other more modern machine learning methods such as decision trees, random forest, gradient boost tree, and neural net, obviously. And they are very powerful in, in prediction. They're more for prediction than inference. Uh, notice that some of these techniques are actually invented by statisticians, including Kraft, random forest, and so on. Uh, I wanted to just add that uh, in addition to the techniques themselves, there's also a different kind of mentality because uh, if the goal is for prediction, we need to have a better way to validate, to select and validate models. So it's, it's, a, it's a very common way in the data science AI world that we will need to split the data into training, validation and test, or at least training versus test. So training is the data set you use to build your model. So basically uh, estimate the coefficients or weights or parameters. Validation is to help you fine tune your model structure. And test is completely unseen while you're building a model. So test would give you an unbiased estimate uh, of the model performance. So the test, test data is extremely important. And what, I'm, what my understanding is, uh, not every statistician split their data into, into two or three parts, but that also depends on whether they're doing inference or prediction. And in the test data, you can generate a lot of measurement, model measurement metrics. Um, in, in, instead of the traditional metrics such as R square, MSE, and so on, uh, machine, machine learning folks and other folks came up with a whole set of metrics such as sensitivity and specificity, which are essentially one minus type two error and one minus type one error. Recall and precision is among the most important and most commonly used uh, metrics to judge how good a model is and also uh, how to select how to select a cutoff value in a binary classification. Computer scientists like to use area under the ROC curve, which is a highly used metric. But in, in the practical business world, many people like to use decile chart and gain chart. 
because these allow these two things allow you to look at the performance at a more granular level, not just uh, in the entire sample. So I would highly recommend these two papers by Efron and uh, the more classic one, classic one by Bryman. This is an illustration of what a decision tree is. Um, for those of you uh, who may not have seen it, let's say you have a very long survey to understand people's finance, financial situation. The survey has a lot, a lot of questions, a long list of questions. And then a combination of some of the answers to the survey give you uh, the holistic financial situation. So you have a survey done, you're happy with that, you've got some data, but now you're asked to do the survey for a larger group of people, a larger sample. But uh, you want to shorten the survey significantly. So what do you do? So one thing people do is to build a predictive model, predict the overall financial metric as a function of some key questions so that we can simplify the, the survey for the next time. And in this case, let's say in the sample, 50% uh, of them are financially well and 50% of them are not. The first question may be, uh, do you have a lot of savings? If it's high, it immediately jumps up to 80% well. If it's low, it goes down to 25% well or 75% unwell. The next question may be, um, do you have enough money for emergency savings if something comes up? So if it is yes, then you have a higher percentage of well, otherwise lower and so on. So a decision tree like, like CARPT gives you a very intuitive way to understand the model and business folks love it. Although from the pure predictive accuracy perspective, it may or may not be the best. Quite often random forest and other and neural net would do a better job. But from the explanation point of view, this is one of the best tools. So topic number five is deep learning. And deep learning is still uh, mostly in level two, the predictive analytics, mostly, um, because it's a subset of machine learning. And machine learning is a subset of AI. So what is deep learning? Underneath deep learning is a concept called neural network. And there are many forms of neural networks, and the most common one is called multi-layer perceptron, MLP. And it looks something like that. It looks like pretty messy, but I will, I will go over that. Uh, it was, it was it is the reason, one reason why it's so powerful and so good is that in, back in 1991, it was already mathematically proved to be a universal approximator to pretty much any nonlinear functions, any functions. So that means it can approximate pretty, pretty much anything if you have enough number of uh, hidden layers or hidden units. So let's, let me just take, uh, go over what it is. The first layer is the input layer. So these are just a set of covariates or predictors or features uh, along with the intercept, which they call it bias, which is different from the statistical bias. Um, <clears throat> so these things are combined, linearly combined to be the Z values, which are inside the hidden layer. And each of these is a hidden unit or a neuron. And then each of these Z, value, Z values is, tr is just transformed to, uh, to a, the I values through a logistic function or sigmoid function. And other people use other functions and the activating functions actually don't matter much, but uh, there's some preference for some other kinds of functions. But in the past, they tend to use logistic functions. And then the I values are further linearly combined to form an estimate for Y, the output variable or the dependent variable, the target variable. And the goal is to minimize the sum of square differences between Y and Y hat or the actual value of Y and the estimated value of Y by optimizing the parameters or the weights. Now you see that there's only four variables and three hidden units, and there are already quite a few weights. But in reality, you have much more variables and you have much more hidden layers and much more hidden units. So it would be, it would easily get to thousands or even millions and billions of parameters very easily. Uh, so that's why it's so complicated. 
and uh, deep learning really means uh, deep learning neural net really means you have at least two hidden layers. So what we have talked about is is sort of uh, is MLP, which is sort of the uh, most foundational neural net or deep learning method, and it's designed for standard IID data, independent and identically distributed data. <clears throat> and if you think about that picture, uh, all the units in one layer and all the units in the next layer, they're all connected to each other. So it's a fully connected network. As a result, there are lots of weight to be estimated. So some very smart people in the past couple of decades came up with some ways to simplify it, to make it more efficient and more accurate. And they came with CNN and RNN. CNN, convolutional neural net, is ideal for image-like data. Uh, if you look at computer scientists, computer science departments, and many of them have been uh, trying to beat each other on image processing algorithms, and quite often it's using CNN algorithms. Uh, and this, the pixels in the picture have some kind of spatial temporal relationships. It allows some sharing of weights. But there are many ways you can restructure it. RNN is for sequential data, such as time series or work sequence. A sequence of works uh, in a document is kind of like a time series. It also allows sharing of weights and has many possible structures. So we will have an example on, C on RNN next. And for a medical use case, let's say we are trying to predict total joint replacement surgery. And using the identified claims data with individual time series of medical codes. Okay, so imagine each patient or each person has multiple time series of medical codes. And it's like a big matrix of time series for each person. And then we, and the question now is how to use this big matrix of time series medical codes to predict the need for total joint replacement surgery. So that's, that, that's the goal. Using different deep learning methods along with tradi more traditional statistical methods. So this paper basically tried many different methods. Um, and ultimately, the winner is uh, RNN, some form of RNN, recurrent neural net. And if you look at this picture here, RNN probably resembles uh, a more classical method known as hidden Markov model. Uh, indeed, uh, it has some similarity to hidden Markov model, but it's sort of a huge extension of it, or at least a non-linear version of, of HMM. Uh, and with the appropriate features, uh, you can use these to predict uh, total joint replacement. The graph on the right shows the performance comparison between different techniques. The y-axis is true positive rate, the higher the better. The x-axis is false positive rate, the lower the better. As you can see, the best curve, the best technique is, uh, is the last one, is the RNN with a lot of features followed by our other RNN architectures, and then CNN, and Lasso, and Random Forest. So this just, tells, just shows that, uh, at least from a pure predictive perspective, deep learning can beat uh, logistic and other things. So we talked about level one and level two analytics. We are going to talk about the last level, but before that, let's cover causality. So causality is kind of important, as I said, that um, in order to understand the, 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 the impact of an action, you need to understand causality. Uh, so the, the impact of taking action A versus action B, we, we typically need some kind of causal assessment. So in the business world, it's a very common question to ask about causality. They may, business people may or may not mention the word causality, but indeed it's about causality. So here are some examples taken from uh, the four P's of business or, mar or marketing. The first one is price. If you have a product uh, and you 
want to see if you decrease the price, would that generate a high demand? That's a causal question. You want to see, uh, you want to understand the impact of some kind of promotion, such as direct marketing or advertising. So that's a causality question. You are opening a new store and you wonder if the location matters or not. That's also a causality question. And you want to understand what it should look like. Should you paint the store in yellow or, or white or other colors? Uh, you have a current product, but you want to change the product features, but you want to see if that would be valuable to your customers. That's also a causality question. So similar questions apply to other fields. How do we answer these questions? Well, uh, the typical way is through RCT or randomized control trial. Uh, statisticians or biostatisticians are very familiar with that. Uh, if you have done experimental design or clinical trial, in the business world, it's known as A-B testing. Basically, you randomly split uh, the, the units into two groups, treatment and control. And every and at the end of the, of the program, every difference is attributable to the treatment versus control. So that's a randomized experiment. That's still the best way, but sometimes we don't have the luxury to carry out an RCT. Then you have to rely on some kind of observational data. So let's look at it an observational data example from the business world. So let's say your goal is to measure the, the impact of a sales campaign using historical sales data. But historically, you didn't do an RCT, so there was, there was no randomized experiment. As a result, there are some confounders. So let's say you're interested in the impact of sales call on whether your customers buy your product or not. So sales call, which would, would, would making a sales call increase their purchase probability. And you want to understand the causal relationship between them. But because historically the sales reps cherry picked by demographics, they tend to pick people who are older and wealthier. And as a result, there's a link between uh, age, income, and uh, treatment assignment. And obviously people who, have, who are older and higher income may also impact the outcome. Um, so how do you identify, how do you isolate the impact of, uh, how do you isolate the, the, the link here? So one thing we need to do is to remove the backdoor path. This is in, co in causal inference literature, this is called the backdoor path. One standard way in the statistics world is through propensity score matching or PSM. Uh, essentially by eliminating this link, between these two. By breaking this link, you're able to estimate the average treatment effect or ATE. Now, the average treatment effect is good for the entire group of people or the entire sample representing the population. But you may be interested in the individual treatment effect because if you know something about the individual treatment effect, you can use it to prioritize future sales costs. Who would actually benefit from a sales cost the most, then you will call them first. In the business world, it's known as uplift modeling. And I happen to be one of the uh, founders of, of the fields, of the field uplift modeling. Uh, in some academic world, it's known as heterogeneous treatment effect or conditional, conditional average treatment effect, Kate, and so on. But they are all similar. So let's look at one example of uplift modeling in the medical world. In the medical world, you may be interested in which patients should receive your treatment. Uh, in, that's in, the, in personalized medicine. In this diagram, in this table, the roles represent whether patients will recover or not after they receive a medical treatment. Columns represent whether they would recover or not if they do not receive a treatment or they just receive a placebo. So you look at this two by two table. If it is yes, yes, that means they would recover whether or not they receive the treatment or not receive the treatment. So that's a waste. Sometimes it's harmful, sometimes it's useless. The only group 
or patients that would benefit from your treatment is this group. These are the people who would recover if you give them a treatment, but would not recover if you don't give them a treatment. So they will only recover if you give them a treatment. So this, re this kind of analysis requires you to, to identify the individual treatment effect or heterogeneous treatment effect. And then you can use it to prioritize the treatment. So that's why uh, uh, uplift modeling is so powerful. Another example that um, we don't have much time to dive into is presidential election. Uh, it's, it, has been, it has become very popular and very important since, the, since 2012, Obama uh, re-election campaign. Since then, presidential elections are using uplift modeling quite a lot. So topic number seven is uh, finally, we get to the top level, prescriptive and optimization. So as I talked about, causality is the link between predictive and prescriptive. Uh, so let's look at some examples of how they are linked together. So in business, we talked about the four P's. First one is price. Would a price discount generate high demand? This is a causality question. But if you, you can quantify the impact of price discount on your demand, you can optimize the price, right? So that becomes an optimization question. So they're linked together. Likewise, if you can quantify the impact of direct marketing and advertising on your outcome, you can then optimize your investment in direct marketing and advertising. And if you know about the impact of uh, location A versus location B, then when you open a new store, you, you can choose the best location. And if you know about the impact of a change in product feature to your customers, you can then best configure your product, right? In order to uh, optimize some kind of metrics. So the optimization and causality are highly linked to each other. Uh, this is just a list of techniques that we won't have time to go over. Uh, we'll rely on the, uh, the, an instructor, an expert to deep dive into some, some of these. But uh, mainly optimization relies on some kind of mindset, objective function and constraints. So objective function is really some kind of business objective, some kind of goal you have expressed mathematically as a function of decision variables. And then you have a set of constraints also expressed mathematically. And once you have those two things, you can optimize this, this optimization model or operations research model uh, mathematically. The loss of techniques from linear programming, individual linear programming, and so on. Uh, some of those actually won Nobel prizes in the past couple of decades. So one famous one is uh, the mean variance optimization invented by Harry Markowitz, who won the Nobel Prize in 1990. Uh, he, did, he did the work in, 19, in early 1950s as part of his PhD dissertation. And he became the, fa the father of modern portfolio theory because uh, he's the one who basically set up and portfolio optimization in this way, using mean and variance. Mean becomes, mean represents uh, the mean return, so basically return variance or standard deviation represents the risk. So mean variance optimization is a one way to balance between risk and return for portfolio optimization. And with that, he became the father of MPT, modern portfolio theory, and won a Nobel Prize as of today, most quantitative analysts in the world are using some variation of MBO to optimize their portfolios. So back in, the, in business or marketing, uh, let's give an example on how optimization is used. So quite often we need to match treatments to individuals or, or customers. And there are many kinds of treatments, so like channel, we can call them, we can send them an email, we can send them a direct mail. And we can, we can have all kinds of messages or incentives, right? No risk, free trial, try it. So how do you align the right channel 
with the right offer, the right message, and how do we uh, allocate the right channel and message combination with, uh, to the right person. So this becomes a very big combinatoric mathematical problem. And because it has a lot of treatment combinations and it becomes a big optimization problem. That's why optimization tools and, and specialists are required to do that. And data scientists usually are required to touch some of those if they get into this kind of optimization problem. So topic number eight, unstructured data, uh, which involves text, images, and voice. Under text, uh, also known as NLP, natural language processing. And we have a lot of documents everywhere, like contractual document, legal document, doctor's notes, or your personal documents. They're all, in, they're all written in works or some kind of forms. Survey verbatims from, from, from qualitative surveys. Search engine is like when a user, when a customer goes to a website and they have a question, they can do some search. The search engine needs to understand what the customer is writing, what kind of question they have, and then they return some kind of appropriate answer. It's also based on NLP. And chatbot these days is getting more popular. Uh, when you don't, if you don't want to call your customer rep, you may get on chat. You may be talking to a real person, but you may be talking to an AI NLP machine. Uh, and that would be based on NLP because uh, they need to understand what you're writing. And under images, radiology is pretty obvious. So X-ray CT scan could be analyzed using AI and image processing um, engines. Uh, even scanning a check could be through computer vision. Uh, security and biometrics are pretty obvious and so on. Speech is another area, uh, let's say in a call center, you, you can use sentiment analysis to understand whether the customers are happy or unhappy. And you can use topic modeling to group their topics, uh, which is another set of uh, AI machine learning or data science techniques. And maybe you just need to gather all kinds of variables or features uh, from the voice and then use those features as an input to another predictive model. So you can use, use them in many different ways. So these are the applications of NLP, image and speech. So let's just quickly go through what techniques typ people typically use. These three unstructured data areas share some kind of uh, similar kind of techniques, but they also, each of them have their own uh, area of knowledge. So for instance, NLP uh, can be based on more traditional computational linguistics, which has a lot to do with English grammar or other languages grammar. And it, it, would, uh, it, would, it, would, it would allow us to take care of um, stop works. Stop works are, thing, are works that are not very meaningful. We can get rid of them. Um, and it also it uses some kind of computational logic. And, but lately, a lot, of the, a lot of the text analytics or NLP algorithms are based on deep learning or neural network. So one of the most common ones is called work embedding. What it is, is really to turn works into numbers. Works are just difficult to deal with. If you can turn works into numbers, then you can do a lot of things because numbers are much easier to handle. You have a lot of algorithms to handle numbers. So that's why it's so, uh, so popular and so powerful. Deep learning based uh, methods such as RNN, attention, transformers, and so on. Those are uh, deep, all deep learning based methods designed for NLP. Under image, the techniques, uh, we, we talked about that already. Uh, CNN, is, uh, is, is, is one of the most popular methods for image recognition. Uh, and image also has is their own set of techniques uh, such as OCR, uh, RCNN, which is combining computer vision and, and modern day CNN. 
um, under speech. So speech data, speech, if speech model is quite often decomposed into a language model and an acoustic model. An acoustic model is simply like uh, an empirical likelihood uh, from a Bayesian sense. So it's given, given a set of actual works, uh, what's the chance that the, the voice signals, the audio signals are like this? So there's sort of an empirical likelihood. Language model is equivalent to a prior. So it's the probability of a, of a work sequence. And, but it can be modeled in many different ways. In the 70s and 80s and early 90s, um, the most popular technique is known as HMM, Hidden Markov Model, which is still very useful. But lately, deep learning kind of ex expanded that or replaced uh, Hidden Markov Model. Topic number nine is social sciences and data science ethics. So social sciences is a big area. Uh, it ranges from sociology to economics to um, psychology and so on. So I will just talk more about uh, economics and psychology. Um, an example is from microeconomics. Let's say you own a small shop selling ice cream. Uh, you can sell ice cream, you can charge ice cream uh, at any price points. Your question is, how do I set the price appropriately in order to maximize your profit? Well, if you set the price very high, you know you have lower sales. If you set your price very low, you have a higher sales. Let's say you, do, uh, you are able to gather some historical data. And these are the historical data. You happen to fit a line, and this is called the demand curve, which means sales as a function of the price. And the $354 is actually known as the price elasticity. You increase the price by $1, you decrease the sales by 354 volume. So once you have a sales equation like this, what you could do next is to plug that in, into the profit equation by multiplying the estimated sales by your unit profit. The unit profit is simply uh, the, the price that you charge minus the cost of making an ice cream. Let's say it's $2. So multiply these two things together, you get a curve. And you can immediately see that the, the optimal price is $5. If you charge more than $5, your sales goes down, but your unit price, unit price goes up. However, um, the total profit goes down, and likewise on the other side. So obviously you can differentiate uh, using calculus. So, so this slide itself kind of connects marketing, microeconomics, statistics, and optimization together on one, on one picture. So another field is uh, behavioral economics, which is one of my favorite areas. Um, it really combines psychology and econ. One of the early discoveries was something called prospect theory. Uh, this won the Nobel Prize in year 2002 by Daniel Kahneman. What he and his team discovered was that if someone's making money, this is sort of a value function or utility function, if they make money in a positive way, they're happier. You know, the value is higher and higher, but there's a diminishing marginal, uh, marginal return, okay? But if the person loses a lot of money or some money, the pain is much steeper. So you, you can see that the, the slope here is much steeper than the slope on the positive side. Uh, this is the loss aversion phenomenon. It's quite universal. Kahneman and colleagues were able to statistically estimate this, this, this asymmetric curve, and which is called prospect theory. If we, have, if we know something about the prospect theory, we understand people's, behavior, uh, people's attitude to risk, and then we can message, uh, message something differently when we talk to customers or patients or, or different kinds of individuals. And we, can, and we know something about their value function 
you can also optimize it in the right way in order to, to uh, handle their loss aversion behavior. So another group is under nudge theory. There are many, many sub, um, sub fields under nudge theory, but I, I'm just listing a few here. Opt-in versus opt-out. Let's say you're interested in uh, getting your students to take a course. If you just tell them to take a course, unless they opt out, most of them would not opt out. So they'll take a course. If you ask them to sign up for a course or register to do something in order to, to register for a course, many of them may not opt in. So guess which one is more successful if we want more people to sign up for a course. So opt out policy is well known to be much more successful than opt in. So that's one behavioral, uh, behavioral finding. The second one is choice architecture and in particular number of choices. If you present people with a number of choices, do you present them with one choice only, meaning no choice, or many, many, many choices, or somewhere in between? Studies found that uh, somewhere in between is the best, right? So the question is how many? It, it, it probably depends on the product and the person. Uh, third one is language framing. When we put something in a message, let's say 50%, we can put them in works or in numbers. 50% could be in works or in numbers. So how do we describe anything? How do we describe anything appropriately in order to maximize their probability of uh, changing behavior? So that's the language framing thing. Uh, a nice book was written by Rich, Richard Thaler uh, in, and, and his colleague in, in 2009, and he won the Nobel Prize in 2017 on behavioral economics. So psychologists and, psychologists and behavioral ec ec economists already got a lot of findings. They have a lot of theories and empirical findings around these topics. So statisticians and data scientists could actually utilize them. We can start with what they found, or even a range of options from what they found. We can do further testing in randomized control trial. We can build statistical models uh, as an input to behavioral change optimization. So, so being able to work with uh, psychologists or behavioral economists could, would be a really, really positive step for, advan for advancing data science techniques. Uh, the last topic under social sciences ethics or data science ethics, this is an increasingly extremely important field. Um, the first one is data, data usage. When we are analyzing data, what kind of data do we use? Uh, a lot of data scientists using, use some sort of found data, whatever data they can find from the internet, but that may be biased. That may not be a good representation of the population. And whether the predictors are appropriate, are we using any protected characteristics? We have to be careful about those. Of course, we need to worry about data privacy and policy. Once you build a model, you can, you can detect whether your model is potentially biased by using a set of fairness metrics. And if the model is indeed biased, you can algorithmically mitigate the bias. And how do you present your model in a more transparent way? And last but not least is governance. So a governance process can help you tie all these things together and also handle some gray areas because chances are sometimes data scientists could run into some gray areas, whether they can or cannot use certain variables, variables and so on. So this is a growing uh, topic and extremely important. And I would highly recommend some of this literature, especially Kathy O'Neill's uh, book, called Weapons of Math Destruction. Uh, the last topic is not really a knowledge area, but really a set of application areas. Uh, when I first got into the industry uh, decades ago, the first thing I did was to pick up a lot of marketing books because I was working in marketing science. And I pick up many MBA marketing books 
to understand what is the marketing strategy, what is marketing segment, market segmentation, market research, and so on. And later on, I got into risk management. So I had to understand risk management, insurance. I also got involved in operations management. So I need to understand call center analytics, intelligent automation. And at one point I was leading healthcare AI and analytics. So I also needed to get into the healthcare field. So no matter what area you're in, it's always effective and efficient if you know something about the business domain. So that's just an encouragement. So last but not least, uh, this is a list of the 10, the list of the 10 topics we just covered very quickly, which is an overview. We are having some experts uh, teach each of them over the, over the next several months. We have already identified uh, experts to teach some of them, but not everyone. So if you have any open suggestions, feel free to let us know. And stay tuned for announcements from NIST, N-I-S-S, or just check out their website on NIST.org. So the very last page is just a bonus page. Uh, quite often when we are reading machine learning AI books, and if you are statisticians, you may not understand the term. So this is a translation between statistics terms and data science or AI terms. So that's all I have. And the rest of it is just a list of references that uh, you, may, you, may, you may read. Thank you. Uh, so I think we have some time for Q&A. Turn it over to Glenn. Or Ling Chao. Hi, uh, so, so we have a question from David Byrne. So the, so the uh, Victor, you mentioned in item seven, so have you considered fractional factorial design? Yes, fractional factorial design is an extremely popular and powerful technique. And I would, I would group it under uh, number six, uh, causal, causal inference. Uh, this is part of the DOE design experiment. I actually used it a lot uh, to design actually transportation modes, airplane and trains and so on. What's the optimal size of seat? Uh, what's the optimal schedule, optimal pricing? It's very powerful because a full factorial design means you, have, you use all kinds of combinations. Fractional factorial is to use an optimal number of combinations. So that would reduce the, the combinations for testing tremendously. It's extremely powerful. So, so yes, and the, the, the after you do the design, of course, you can optimize your configuration. So that would be sort of covering both number six and number seven, or at least a subset of them. Thank you. Yeah, so, so David Byrne has had a, just had a, I mean, the common, so the, so the, he used it to determine optimal combination factors in a marketing campaign. So I think he's referring to the fractional factorial design. Yes, that is a popular usage of fractional factorial design in marketing campaign. Especially in the, in the credit card world, uh, when you have many attributes, like the color of the card, um, uh, the teaser rate, uh, the branding, and so on, you, you, you can easily end up with millions or at least several thousands of combinations. But you can use fractional factorial design to reduce the number of combinations uh, and for, 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 for testing and optimization. So, so yes, it's, it's a very popular tool. And I used, I started using it a lot in the 90s. Yeah, thank you. So we have another question from Sima. So the, uh, does uplift causal modeling use propensity score or is more like the Perl's approach to draw causality? Yeah, so uplift modeling could be applied to experimental, experimental data or observational data. If the data is already experimental, meaning it's based on RCT randomized control trial, you don't need propensity score to adjust. If the data is observational, you may need some sort of uh, adjustment. Uh, PSM is one of the methods to adjust the data such that it looks like RCT, it looks like experimental. So it's sort of, PSM is, to, is for causal inference and uplift modeling is, in, is another set of methods that is designed to optimize um, or, de or determine individual treatment effect so that you can optimize at the individual level. So they are sort of uh, hand in hand related, but they're not the same thing. Okay, thank you. So we have another question for Madeline. 
So the, uh, could you explain the slide where you compare different methods and lasso words? So the, were you considering the lasso as used in logic regression or as a machine learning method? Yeah. Uh, that paper was just based on uh, logistics. So it was a lasso logistic. You could technically use lasso on machine learning methods as well, but that paper was specifically about lasso on logistic. And their comparison found that uh, RNN and CNN are better than lasso logistic. Yeah, so thank you. So Sima had a follow up comment. So about the uplift uh, causal modeling. So the, so the, from that, can you draw individual treatment effect? Yes, so uplift modeling is designed to estimate individual treatment effect. But some people may not like to call it individual treatment effects. So they call it heterogeneous or conditional and so on because it's not 100% individual, sort of a sub, sub, subgroup level. Some statisticians call it subgroup, and, subgroup analysis. Uh, but the goal is really <clears throat> trying to get to individual level as much as possible. So basically people re respond to treatment differently. So we're trying to get to individual treatment effect or even sub subgroup level treatment effect. And with that, we can prioritize the treatments. Okay, thank you. So do we have more questions from the audience? Yeah. So, so, okay, so let's thank the uh, Victor again. So the, let us keep, uh, keep uh, everyone updated. So, oh, so David Byrne has a question. Oh. So yeah, so we'll uh, we'll keep everyone updated if we uh, for any more information about future uh, tutorials in data science. Yeah. So thank the, you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye bye.